If you're not sick or poor, what does Jesus have to do with you? Is religion really just a crutch for weak-minded people? Or is there something more? In this five-week series, you can find answers to the question, what is the good news for the person who has everything? The usual Easter sermon goes something like this. You have a problem, Christ is the answer, repent and be saved. But what if you don't have a problem? To those people, let's call them the strong, we usually say something like this. You may think that you're happy, fulfilled, useful, mature, but you're actually really miserable. You've got a problem. And the problem is that you are too full of self-deceit and pride to know that you even have a problem. And that's your problem. Happy Easter. Churchy people love to come to church and get their toes stepped on, uh, have their feelings hurt a little bit, get a feeling of how bad they are and have the pastor meddle in their business. It's sort of a spiritual sadism or a ministry of masochism. This being our first try, I'll use the lowest setting. Repent, be sorrowful, feel bad about yourself, and then Jesus will forgive you for eternity. I mean, it's kind of like religion becomes uh, medicine. The worse tasting it is, the better it must be for you. <laughs> this could be called the good news for the person who's in the gutter. And their story usually goes something like this. I was miserable. I was lost and tormented by guilt over the way that I had been living. I had tried everything and nothing seemed to work. Then I found Jesus and I asked him to come into my life. And since then, my life has been filled with joy. Well, that's the good news for the person who's in the gutter. But what about the good news for the person who has everything? The person who is reasonably happy, who has a reasonably solid marriage and family, who has good friendships, a good job, feels fulfilled in life, uh, plenty of resources, and maybe even some or a lot left over for nice clothes, a good car, a beautiful house, summer camp for the kids, lots of extracurriculars and regular vacations, or maybe everything in this amazing store. Well, here's some good news for that person. God doesn't have to destroy us in order to deliver us. So this Easter, let's start with what's going well. Where are things good in your life this Easter? Where are things you might even say strong? Today on Easter, we're starting a new series called The Good News for the Person Who Has Everything. And it's based on a book by Bishop Will Williman of the basic same title. Over the next several weeks, we're gonna take a look at these different themes. Today, do I have to be weak? Next week, it's already yours. The week after, a gift to be used. A life of gratitude, and we'll wrap it up with this question, what's the good news for the person who has everything on my own? Now, if you'd like to pick up the book and read it along with us, you can find it in our micro bookstore or buy it anywhere that you get books at. All right, let's remember the usual Easter sermon. It goes, again, something like this. You have a problem, Christ is the answer, and you need to repent and be saved. Instead of assuming that your life is going to hell in a handbasket this Easter, <laughs> this is what today's Easter message is gonna be. Life is pretty good. God already loves you. Say yes to following Jesus. And even if your life is good, it can get better, much better than you ever thought in ways that you never even contemplated. But let's go back first before we get to that Easter sermon and explore just a little bit the usual Easter sermon. Do you remember what it was? You have a problem. Christ is the answer. Repent and be saved. Now there's three problems with the usual Easter sermon that I want to highlight today. And the first one is, it slips into a kind of religious self-righteousness. It's really easy for the person who's saying this to end up basically implying that you have a problem that I don't have anymore because 
I found Jesus and it all got fixed. But must one be sad and depressed and wallowing in their own sin and immaturity and chaotic and traumatic relationships uh, for the good news of Jesus to mean anything to them, for the resurrection that we're celebrating today, to have something to say to them? Must you be in the gutter before God has any good news for you? Well, Bishop Williman says this, from what I know of the Bible, the story there is usually that few of us can boast of finding Jesus. He finds us. And the important thing is not what I decide about God, but the fact that in Christ, God has decided for me. My inevitable half-hearted acceptance of Christ is nothing in comparison to God's full-bodied, full-hearted acceptance of me. Think of it this way. If you're hanging onto a cliff like these two crazy people, whose grip strength is really important? Your grip strength or their grip strength? Really, the person whose strength matters is the one who's hanging on to you, who's up on top of the cliff, not yours hanging on to them. Because if they're really strong, you can let go and they will still hold you. Now, before you think this couple is totally crazy, take a step back and here's what the scene actually looks like. My brother had an experience like this when he was a kid. We used to live on a lake. It was Geist Reservoir in Indianapolis. And my parents had a boat and we had a dock. And in the winter, the cove was frozen over. And my brother was out with a friend on the dock and he fell through the ice. And his friend yanked him back up out of the water and onto the dock, probably saving his life. Now, whose strength was really important in that moment? My brother's or his friend? You're right, his friend. We are so preoccupied with the need to make a decision for Christ that we forget that on Easter, God has made a decision once and all for us. I love the way that Paul, the first missionary of the church and the author of many of the books of our Bible says it. He's talking about Adam, of course, Adam and Eve and Adam's sin in relationship to Jesus well, Jesus act on the cross. Uh, listen to what Paul says. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. All right, so we're talking about the problems with the usual way that we talk about the good news, uh, the good news for the person in the gutter. And the first one is that it slips into a kind of self-righteousness. The second one is that you end up with a sort of subtle selfishness. Here's what I mean by that. Christian Smith, a sociologist back in the early 2000s, was studying American youth and their faith, and he coined a term, moral therapeutic deism, that described the faith of teenagers in America today. By moral, he means that they understood God to be like a rule giver, like do this, don't do that. Moral therapeutic. Therapeutic in the sense that they were like a therapist that God made them feel better. And deism, moral therapeutic deism, in the sense that God is not very involved. God was like a watchmaker who built a watch, wound it up, let it run, and doesn't really get involved with it much from there on. In other words, God doesn't really put any demands on us. The notion that Jesus is here just to soothe us and make us feel better, make us feel like we've been to a therapist's office, well, that's a heresy that's hard to dispel. Bishop Williman says this, perennial is our attempt to turn the gospel of God into a means of getting what we want out of God. But the gospel is God's means of getting what God wants out of us. Lately, I've had a fun time playing with AI and AI tools. And so I was trying to make a picture of Jesus as a therapist. And I told AI first to make a picture of Jesus as a therapist with a tweed coat over a robe, uh, sitting in a therapist's office. And this is what I got. Apparently AI thinks that Jesus is a woman. <laughs> Jesus transitioned. So I went back and maybe uh, I wasn't clear to AI and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna say, make a picture of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I still got like 75% pictures of women. AI really thinks Jesus has transitioned to a woman. So let's make it that today. All right, I know I'm being silly. And uh, I want to be real clear here. I'm not trying to badmouth therapists. I've seen therapists throughout my life. I've seen one right now. Um, therapy can be very, very powerful process of transformation. 
What I am trying to say is that what Jesus is all about may not be and probably is not primarily about you and what you want. Jesus may be first and foremost about what God wants. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Jesus gives us this paradoxical statement that I think sums up something of what it means to follow Jesus. In fact, you might even call it the good news of following Jesus. All right, so far we've looked at a couple of problems with the usual way of thinking about things. The first is a kind of slipping into a subtle self-righteousness, a subtle selfishness. But the third problem is that it presents a sort of Hail Mary Jesus, a Hail Mary God. Do you know what a Hail Mary is? A Hail Mary is when a football team is down and there's only like one play left and so they send all their players down the field and the quarterback throws this huge ball way down the field hoping that someone on the team will catch it and score a touchdown and win the game. This almost never works unless you're playing for Notre Dame and you've got touchdown Jesus in your end zone. I mean a Hail Mary Jesus is something like this. I tried everything. I tried self-help, I tried therapy, I tried going to the gym, I tried multivitamins, I tried crystals and magnets, I tried retail therapy, I bought all the stuff, I, I tried it all. I even tried agnosticism and atheism, and none of those worked. The only thing I haven't tried is God, so I'm going to throw a Hail Mary, <laughs> and I guess I'll try God. What we end up here with is a sort of stopgap God, a get out of jail free Jesus, or a sort of I've tried everything, I might as well try God, God. The old saying goes that there are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, but the problem with that is that foxhole conversions, foxhole religion, is usually very short-lived. I had an experience with this when I was a little kid. I was like in elementary school and we lived at Fall Creek Apartments in Indianapolis. and. I loved Michael J. Fox and he had these cool little skinny skateboards and thanks to Google Maps uh, we can go back and look exactly at where this happened. So I'm going down this hill on this teeny little skateboard and in the wisdom of my elementary self I'm wearing my plastic cleats from baseball. <laughs> this is just ridiculous. And of course when you get going down a big hill on one of those skinny little skateboards it starts wobbling and wobbling and wobbling and I lose control and I jump, I bail from the skateboard. And of course, my feet get no traction on the asphalt. They go out from underneath me. I go down on my knee and I just scrape my knee up. I cut my knee up huge. And there's blood going down my knee. And, and of course, I have to get back home at this point. So I walk home and I walk home and I keep walking home. And this is like, like I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to bleed to death before I get home. And I keep walking home and I keep walking home. <laughs> and I'm, I'm getting more and more scared and I'm starting to bargain with God. God, if you stop this, if you stop the bleeding, then I'll do this and I'll do that. And finally, finally, I get back to our apartment. So I get into our apartment. My mom is not there. And I climb into bed and my knee is still bleeding. And I tell God, God, I will read the whole Bible from cover to cover if you make my knee stop bleeding. I pick up my Bible and I get through the first chapter of Genesis and my mom comes home. That's as far as I got. And I did eventually go back and make good on that promise to God, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I finally read the Bible all the way through. You see, my religious conviction was pretty short-lived <laughs> when it was based well, in the trenches. So here's a question for you to talk about. When have you seen short-lived Hail Mary solutions, whether religious, spiritual, or otherwise? Let's talk about that. Remember the usual Easter sermon? It goes like this. You have a problem. Christ is the answer. Repent and be saved. But I'm not delivering the usual Easter sermon today. Here's the Easter message that I want to deliver today. Life is pretty good. God already loves you. Say yes to following Jesus. If the good news for the person in the gutter is that you got a problem, Jesus is the answer, and repent and be saved, then the good news for the person who has everything is this. I was happy and fulfilled, and each day was your joy to me, and life was a shower of blessings. 
And then Jesus showed me how much greater joy life could be when I rose above the selfish pursuit of my own happiness and the preoccupation with my own problems. And losing my life for others and for God and God's work and using my blessings for something greater than myself, that's when I found true life. All right, I'm not trying to say here that people who have everything don't have any needs or that the strong amongst us don't have needs that need to be met. It's just that they have a sort of peculiar, special need. And this need calls a sort of unique message of the good news of God and Jesus this Easter. Jesus calls us not to make our life a little less miserable, but to make our life count. Count for the rescue mission of God to God's beloved in the world. Or as Bishop Williman says, the real message of the New Testament is about a gift which then leads to an obligation. An obligation? I thought this was a gift. What are you talking about an obligation or duty? Well, yeah, there is an obligation. You don't get to follow Jesus and still be a racist. You don't get to follow Jesus and still be homophobic. You don't get to follow Jesus and still hoard your wealth and greed. You don't get to follow Jesus and do these things. What you do get to do, the obligation, is to love God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. You don't get to follow Jesus and objectify people. You don't get to follow Jesus and ignore justice and love. What you do get to do is follow Jesus and love everybody. Repentance then becomes not a one-time act, but an ongoing lifestyle. It's a thinking through every day and saying, what's keeping me from following Jesus in these ways, in the way of love and justice, and turning from those things and turning towards Jesus to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God. Everything, all of that stuff that is going good in your life, all of that becomes part of the mission of God. Everything you got, everything. All your strengths, all your weaknesses. Or as Bishop Williman says, the glory of the Christian faith is that rather than devastating us because of our human weaknesses, it delivers us by building on our God-given strengths. Okay, so today's Easter message is life is pretty good. God already loves you. So say yes to following Jesus. Salvation then becomes not just a day that you were saved on, I hear this a lot, like I was saved on January 15th, 1976 at 1.43 p.m. when I knelt at the bed and I prayed for Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. But rather, salvation becomes the moment 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on a cross and in the power of God, he was raised and the tomb was empty. On that day, you were saved. In the cross and the empty tomb, all of humanity is forgiven, all of humanity is set free, all of humanity is healed. True conversion, a turning, a changing, a rebirth, it happens when we realize that the God that we thought that was out for us, an enemy, is actually a God who is for us, a God who is a friend, or as Paul says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Or Paul Tillich, the 20th century German theologian, put it this way, accept your acceptance. Or as his Swiss counterpart, Karl Barth said, yes is all the Christian life is about. The date that you were saved is the date that you accepted your acceptance. The date that you said yes, and you began to participate in God's rescue mission in this world. You and I can do little to add to or improve upon God's acceptance of us in Christ, except to say yes and to enjoy it. To enjoy it, to enjoy it. Or as Jesus put it, repent because the kingdom of God is here. Jesus is here, alive. God is alive, not dead. And God loves you, loves you. That's the truth of Easter. That's the truth of the empty tomb. Turn from everything that would hinder you from accepting that truth and sharing it with everyone around you and turn toward Jesus this Easter and tomorrow and the next day and the day after. That's the good news. And so here's again today's message. 
life is pretty good. God already loves you. Say yes and follow Jesus. All right, here's one last chat question for us today. In light of God's love for you, what is one area where you have turned to follow Jesus' way and where is one area you have struggled to do so? Let's talk about that.